my guys. Happy Tuesday. My hair looks like shit. Anyways, so, alright, on to lesson 11. And this is page 469 of Modern Magic. So, we are fully through, finally, with the Tantric and the Sex Magic. So, very good. <laughs> Alright, so last night, what did you guys do for the new moon? It was just, it was really cool because it was just, I, I'd never work with Celine, the goddess, and she just kind of popped up. And I just noticed her, and so I took a, oh, a, a Joss paper. I think I showed you guys my Joss paper. It's where you fold it three times. It's uh, spirit money. So I did um, a Joss paper for her, Celine, goddess of the moon. Um, I planted my seeds. Um, and then I did my candle magic. Simple candle magic. Um, focused on uh, better relationships with people. Um, and just, just blessings planting seeds for them to sprout until the new moon so that's <clears throat> or the full moon so that's always exciting so it was pretty cool though it was very very calm and just very good energy so i don't know what the moon was in but it was good it was really good so then i had to uh, uh use my tetragrammatron for manifestation better manifestation it was pretty cool. It was really nice. The flame went crazy. You guys can see it probably right now on my live stream. That's about to happen. So. Alright, here we go. So this is all about like raising energy, directing energy. So this is a lot of energy work. So I think this is really good for all of us to actually learn and go over and study. So. Alrighty. Alrighty, class, are you ready? Joking. Alright, so, there is an old legend that when Moses first descended the mountain, God gave him the secrets of the Kabbalah. Okay, so that would make more sense than those ridiculous tablets that don't make any sense. So, this told humanity what it could do. So, Moses, upon seeing the worship of another deity, when he descended, destroyed public knowledge of these secrets, uh, saving them only for the high priests of Israel. Alright, so, shady business back then. A lot of shade being thrown, especially by Moses. Terrible. Awful. Alright, so, when Moses again returned at the top of the mountain, which he should have actually fall, fell, he came back with the, whatever, the Ten Commandments, so, these were filled with thou shalt nots, telling people what they must not do. So, the people were truly Christian of Israel, so they were not yet able to accept the freedom which is inherent in the Kabbalah. That's sad. Control. So much control with organized religion. It's just sickening. Alright, so. Alright, today most people are still not able to be free. True. So they are infected with the following various isms. Alright, so sometimes to their death, people follow the doctrinal line of religious groups, political groups, and peer groups, or blindly follow one or more political, religious, military, or economic leaders. Hmm, well, that sounds like a Cheeto. Anyways, the common person is unable to think for him or herself. This is a symptom of the current uh, Episcopalian age mentality. We are moving into the age of Aquarius now, where everybody's true, true, everything is showing. So, this is completely over, um, and I fear will be with us for many years to come. So, this book was written quite a while ago. It's over. Completely over. So, but there is hope. There are some people who are beginning to think, who are beginning to wake as if from a long sleep. So, these are the people who, have the, uh, who are the advance guard of the coming Aquarian Age. So, yes, we have descended into the Aquarian Age. And I think that is the fifth dimension, too, when our body's crystalline turn to crystalline and we start to manifest more so m miracles if you will all right where'd I go okay so there are the people uh, who are not members of various dogma filled organizations the 
I hope somebody fucking crashes. I really do. I can't wait because I will go spit and piss on the car as they're dying. Oh, that was bad. I shouldn't have said that, but still. Alright. Um, because for, for the most part, they work by themselves or in a very small group of like minded persons. That's why I stay solitary. I don't trust people. You can't. But there's still good people out there. And lots of love. <laughs> so they are the wave of the future and the hope of tomorrow. <laughs> I hope. Because things do not look good for the United States. And I have to applaud the UK right now for the amazing protests. Um, I love you guys. You guys are amazing. I wish I was there with you. Alright, so, is this an, oh, elitist attitude, absolutely yes and absolutely no. For, um, for a while there is an Aquarian Age Elite, so it is not limited to those with money or political power as for previous Elites. So, no, this is an open Elite which everyone can join at any time and make eddies, ripples, and waves in the ocean of our coming world. Pretty odd. This is very synchronistic. I like it. I like it. Alright, if you stay, if you have been studying and practicing the lessons of this course, you are well on your way to becoming a full-fledged member of the Aquarian Age, if you are not one already. I think I'm getting there. I, I just, I don't know. Okay, so, but should you not, you must not look, oh, must not look down on others who have not advanced as far as you have. So they may one day jump into the future, at a rate accelerated even above your own. So, that's very true too. Very interesting. Alright, so, it is said that the true and deep secrets of magic cannot be told. It is said that the true secrets of magic are hidden and shown only to initiates of secret occult bodies, such as the true Rosicurians or Illuminati, and then, only after the student has spent years of study and practice, and has passed serious and even life-threatening tests, um, I think that's a little ridiculous. I mean, I do think that's true, and I think it's not true. You don't have to be initiated into anything. You don't have to be initiated into anything. Alright, so all of this is true. From this point on, I can show you no more. I can teach you no more magical secrets. Yet, there are still many pages more in this book. Why shouldn't this... should this be? To answer this question, I have to teach you what I consider to be the ultimate secret of true magic. So there are three things needed to work any magic. This is exciting. This is very exciting. One, the ability to raise, control, and direct magical energy. Which I know, I think, I think we all know how to do that. Number two, the knowledge of what to do with this energy. Ability does not equal knowledge. So, three, a positive attitude of self-assurance. There we go, three steps. Simple, but hard, very. So, in the past lessons, um, I have described these things. I've given you exercises and rituals to help you develop all three of the above talents. So, it is interesting to note that no books on magic ever clearly state all of the above three points. They don't either. No book. No book except for this book has. I have read a lot of books in my life. Alright, so, the famous magical texts or grimoires of the past only discuss the second point, and that is the knowledge of what to do with that energy that you have raised. So, uh, this is because they were meant to be used as work workbooks by experienced mages, 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 yeah, mages, or magicians in training who already know these things from personal lessons and experience. So that makes a lot more sense then. Now, if you take back and you take those three, those three major points in working your magic, um, and then you go back and apply those to what you have learned from any type of grimoire. It's pretty cool. Now, I didn't even really have that in my mind. But now I can see with my own candle magic from last night up until the full moon, it's going to be a cycle. So I can see now I have a little more reassurance of myself and of the magic and of the energy raised. So, okay, where'd I go? 
So if you have been practicing the rituals given in this course, you have been following an easy, tested system. The system has taught you uh, to have a good attitude, which is part of the result of working with the tarot cards and doing the middle pillar ritual. I still can't do that ritual. It is too much for me. I mean, it is just way too much. It directly affects my central nervous system and makes me freak out. It's too much. So it has also taught you many ways to raise and control the psychic energy needed to perform magic. So, and if you have been studying and practic practicing the techniques and rituals of these lessons, you will also be prepared to take the next step in your magical advancement. The ultimate magical wisdom cannot be communicated to you by any person or group. You have to have it within you. It, it's a burst of information or a download is what I like to say. So, where'd I go? Any person or group which claims this ability is lying to you. Remember that. Any person or group which claims this ability is lying to you. Always remember that. Each person much must seek it individually. So the so-called lost word of or secret name of God can never be communicated to you by another person. You must learn it by yourself. One way to do this is by following the various systems of sc or schools of magic. You are encouraged to find one that particularly fits your needs. However, if you have been doing the rituals of this course, you should be prepared to discover that information and take the next step in learning the true innermost secret of magic. So, it's pretty cool. So, if you have uh, been regularly practicing the techniques, exercises, uh, and rituals, you at the very least should have or be beginning to achieve good control of magical energy. The Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram, the Banishing Ritual of the Hexagram, the Middle Pillar Ritual, and the Circulation of the Body of Light are all techniques which train a person in a, the ability to raise and control magical energy. So if you have made a talisman which has achieved its goal, you have proved yourself the success, successfulness of your ability to raise and control willed magical energy. Yep, I can actually attest to that and say yes, I, I successfully have done this with talismans. So the important part of this is your ability to use your conscious and unconscious will to control the magical energy and put it to the uses you desire. So perhaps you have seven books with other exercises on how to raise and control magical energy. Some are very good, but it is my feeling that the repetition of a basic exercises with a millennia of development will work much better than spreading out on your personal energies by memorizing large numbers or pra of practices with fewer repetitions of each exercise. So, alright, a positive attitude, as mentioned, should be being developed as a direct result of the tarot card contemplation practice, and that is where you take just the uh, major arcana and you work with them for quite a long time write them down pull them every day like I have been doing and now I incorporate the rest of the cards with the major so it's very very good so its development will also be aided by the study of the harmony of the universe as indicated by the balance of nature and shown on the tree of life the more successful you have in gray magic successes you have in gray magic the more confident you will become in your own magical abilities and the more positive your attitude will become. Um, I don't know if I've become more positive. I think to a degree, maybe about that much. So it's it's a mindset. It's, it's really, it's hard, especially in this world. So uh, there are many books with spells, rituals, ceremonies, philosophy, theory, and information which could help you, help add you to your knowledge of where to direct the raised energy raised and controlled energy. In fact, I could teach you much more, but I feel no need to do as do so as it is intermediate information. So, instead I will teach you, this is the fun part, um, instead I will teach you how to obtain higher information, the knowledge of true magical secrets for yourself, so channeling from the divine. I feel very fuzzy right now. There we go. Alright, so, where did I go? Alright, so this is knowledge, oh wait, this knowledge is not available on the physical plane of Earth. It can only be learned from entities on higher planes. So, interesting, isn't it? 
I like that. So sometimes these entities are called aspects of the higher self. The uh, Yechida, some people call these entities manifestations of God, the process of how to reach and communicate with these entities will be discussed later in this lesson. So I wish to stress that there is nothing to fear from the beautiful natural techniques that you will soon be learning. The best is yet to come. Hmm. I like it. Interesting. So, if you look over the hundreds of pages of this book, which you have followed so far, you will know that we have covered a tremendous amount of material. Perhaps most importantly, I have tried to show you how to be a magician, how to think, act, and feel like a true witch. With this knowledge, you should be able to construct your own rituals and ceremonies rather than being locked into the printed words of dead hands. And that's what was amazing about last night, because that ritual just poof, it just came. And it was amazing. So one of the most important topics I have covered in these lessons are the applications and methods of white and gray magic and how to avoid a falling into the pit of black magic. Remember too though um, that I have always maintained that not all authorities agree with my three divisions of magic. I gave them only so that we could communicate better. So for in spite of what they, any authorities say, there is no such thing as black, white, or gray magic. There's not. So to explain why uh, this is so requires some more information. So, part of the process of becoming a magician is learning to discern reality from actuality. So occultists have always maintained that everything is made up of vibrational energy. Very true. So modern scientific thought has finally come to the same conclusion, calling it wave theory. So yet a wall is still a wall, a desk is still a desk, both are really truly solid. They support the weight of the objects, so I cannot place my hand through them uh, without damage to the wall, the desk, and or my hand. So, this is, this is their reality. Still, both science and occultism insist that the wall and desk and the hand are only vibrational energy. So, that is their actuality. What is actual may not appear real. Mm -hmm. I love it. What is real may or may not be actual. So likewise, some things may appear to be true and may in reality be true, but their actuality may be false. I love that. I love this. It is really true that the sun rises every morning and even if the clouds prevent me from seeing it, that it is the reality. So, but the actuality is that the earth spins, giving the appearance that the sun rises. So, in actuality, the sun never rises. Most of us will agree that killing is bad and evil. But if people who believe that uh, this is so, wait, this is so, go to war and kill every day, are they evil? From a magical point of view, I would have to say no. They're protecting us, our country. So, for a true magician, there is no good or evil. So, that obviously, that those should be wiped out. Wipe them out of your brain. So. Uh, there is no morality, yet a true magician is usually far more moral than his or her non-magician friends and neighbors, especially those professing to be highly moral. How can this be so? So, it is because true magicians understand the law and workings of karma. A, ma or a magician realizes that he or she is totally free to choose to do whatever is desired. However, the true magician will invariably choose the path of light, what is called by non-magicians morally correct choice. So the true magician chooses the path of light. So not for moral purposes, rather this is the path chosen because the magician realizes that whatever is done will come back to him or her, such as the universal law of karma, and not the threefold law. No, it's the snake eating its tail, it's what goes around comes around, so. Alright, so. Where did I go? Thus, for the true magician, there is no such thing as white, gray, or black magic. There is only magic, period. So, um, it so happened that because of the understanding of the law of karma, a true magician will studiously avoid what non-magicians or beginning magicians would normally call black magic. People who are not aware of the law of karma behave morally because they are uh, given a code of morals or a set of laws to follow because they cannot see an immediate effect from breaking that code, there is always the possibility that they will do so. So thus, 
uh, people who claim to be moral are far more likely to break their own moral code than a magician who does not believe in a set of laws to govern morality. That does make a lot more sense. It's like um, kids raised without religion um, turn out to be nicer, and that's true. So, are there black magicians? Most definitely, yes. So, but they should never be considered true magicians because they do not understand the functioning of fundamental rule of magic, the law of karma. If they did, they would not do black magic. So, there's still another aspect to what some people might call black magic. If you were dying of, of a painful, incurable disease, might there not be the possibility that you would commit suicide? Ooh, that struck a nerve. Some of you reading this will say, yes, it is, pos it is a possibility. Others will think, no, no way. But there are some moralists who consider it wrong to commit suicide under any conditions. I'm not trying to encourage suicide. I am merely saying that it is impossible to consider an action good or bad, black magic or otherwise, unless we know the karmic result of the action. So, most of us would agree um, that it would be a that it would be bad for us to cut off the arm of a good friend. But suppose the arm was um, gangrious, um, and the friend would die if the arm was not removed. It would be karmically bad for us not to help by removing the arm. So of course it might be the karmic, karmically correct time for the friend to go through the transition known as death. Then it would be karmically bad for us to save the friend's life. So as you can see, there are many complexities in determining the karmic correctness of an action. This is why doing a divination is so important before performing a magical art, which will affect you or your environment. So yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting. So, in the biblical story, Jonah was told by God to go and preach. He chose not to do so, and the karma of that action put him in the belly of a great fish doubt it, but the karmically correct decision would have been to preach. Had a thousand people bar barred his way, it still would have been karmically bad for him not to preach, even if he had to fight his way through those people. <laughs> so if you communicate with a higher spiritual entity and decide to follow or not follow the advice of that entity, you will be responsible for the karmic result of your action. If you decide to do something which agrees with instructions, from higher entities, and someone tells you no, it is karmically correct for you to disagree with that person and even push him or her out of the way if need be. So, but remember, you will, you will be karmically responsible for whatever happens, especially because you are a magician or a witch. You must accept responsibility for all of your actions. What you are now is a direct result of what you do today. As you sow, you shall reap. So. Discovering things from higher spiritual entities on other planes of existence and deciding to do to do them is called finding your true will. And as St. Augustine and Aleister Crowley said, do what thou will shall be the whole of the law. So, this is not a license for hedonism uh, and what some people may call immorality. Um, in fact, just the contrary is true. In reality, it is a call to become responsible for your own actions to become united with divinity and to do God's will, or the goddess, or other gods. Your actions will require that you ever tread the path of light, and the guide on the path is love. For as Crowley added, love is the law, love under will. So, even though he didn't follow all of that, it's still. So every once in a while, the sensationalist press will tell the story of a man or woman who did something terrible, such as beating a spouse <laughs> Oops, or a child to death because their victim was possessed by the devil. Some add that God told me to do this. That's ridiculous. So, the training in this book does not increase the possibility that you m may become demented enough to do such a thing. In fact, it helps prevent it. So, we are not dealing with mediumship or possession. We will be dealing with communication. So, furthermore, there is always a simple way to decide if something is correct for you. You should have noticed that over the past few months, as you have been practicing the rituals, 
um, and techniques of this course, your intuition has improved. This is a natural result of the rituals and exercises which you have been doing. So if something doesn't seem right or feel right to you, don't do it. It's that simple. And literally, that has become, yes, my, no, I, I don't want to do that. No, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not doing that. You have to say no. So, if you have a feeling that someone you know may be possessed by the devil and you have a desire to make that devil leave by doing bodily harm to the person who is possessed, it is you who needs help. I want to read that again. So, alright, if you have a feeling that someone you know may be possessed by the devil and you have a desire to make that devil leave by doing bodily harm to the person possessed, it is you who needs help. So, that just burst a lot of bubbles. I love it. Alright. Okay, so, the systems which I will share with you are quite safe, since some people are concerned about direct communication with higher spiritual entities, as opposed to somewhat indirect communications or magical evocation. Let, re let me repeat this here. Nothing in this or any other lesson will be dangerous or could cause danger to you or others if you follow instructions. Nothing taught in these lessons could lead you to what general morality might consider evil. There you go. Perfect. It's perfect. Alright, so. Alright, so. I have written on other pages about the little nasties and how they can be bothersome. And the astral nasties. They're very easy to deal with. So. I discussed earlier in this lesson um, that when you come into contact with higher spiritual entities, you should listen to what they have to say. As you may have guessed, I did not mean that you should obey the little nasties. Little nasties being denizens of what some people call the lower astral plane are not higher spiritual entities. What I mean by higher spiritual entities are three things. Direct manifestation of the divine, the gods, um, the archangels and the order of the angels. Furthermore, you, need to, you may need to make tests to see if these entities are the spiritual beings they claim to be. So, how to do this will be explained later, but first let's look at the entities which, through ethereal and existing primarily on other planes, are not higher spiritual entities. So, we have the etheric body. I like this part. So we have the etheric body. This is an, an emanation of all created things. It is not the true astral double. And there is something like <clears throat> a halfway between astral and physical. It sometimes can take on the appearance of a person on a higher plane, but it's always attached to a living, living being. So, now we have the astral body. Okay, so this is a manifestation of the true spiritual aspect of a living entity. Again, it is always attached to an incarnate being, which would be us. So, when detached, it quickly moves to higher planes of existence in order to reincarnate. In this detached condition, they are too busy to occupy your time. When attached to some individual ego, they can be seen as such. Higher spiritual entities are not linked to a particular ego. So, Azoth. This is also known by the Sanskrit term Akasha. Correct pronunciation is Akash or astral light. Remember in the other book, The Ritual and Doctrine of High Magic? Don't become too intoxicated with the astral light. So, where did I go? Oh, it appears as bright as and as changeable according to a person's will. The past, present, and future can be seen within the Azoth, but it does not have an independent personality, since futures are only possible futures. Getting lost in the astral light can lead you to ignoring the present. This can lead you to the home for space cadets. <laughs> that makes you go crazy. Remember to keep your feet firmly planted in the present. So, now we have artificial elementals. So these are entities created by human forces and are composed of only one element. They are focused toward one purpose. So if you leave them alone, they will ignore you depending upon the strength of the will of their creator. 
they will appear more or less gaunt when seen on the astral plane. I have created one, yes. The empty ones. So if you live in a large city, these entities can be seen in the physical form in the skid row section of town. They look human, but they have no soul and no hope for the future. They can sometimes show great humor and daring, but quickly fade into the depths of despair. Their eyes show either madness or emptiness. So these poor creatures also exist on higher planes. Their touch brings despair and fear. A little creepy. So, elementaries. So, these are the gnomes of earth. Undines of water, slips of air, and salamanders of fire. They are usually improperly called elementals when they're not. So, although composed of only one element, they have their own will and usually do not bother humans. In fact, they prefer it if humans ignore them. Interesting. Is that not interesting or what? So, larvae. So, um, these are also known as lemurs. It is believed that they live off the essence of blood. They feed, so to speak, on sick or injured people. They can be dispersed only easily by a projection of pure spiritual white light. Now we have ghosts. So, when the astral body separates from the ego, it normally moves to a position where it can reincarnate. Sometimes a strong desire for the physical world keeps an astral body in the lowest of the spiritual planes. In this condition, they are known as ghosts. They tend to be uh, quite sorrowful, and they refuse to evolve, encouraging their evolution. May or may not be successful, but it will give you karmic brownie points. Now we have pseudo ghosts. These are not related to true ghosts. They're closer to little nasties. They feed off any energy given to them, and will imitate the actions of ghosts in order to get people to pay attention and give them energy. By reading the astral light, yeah, by reading the astrolite, they can know your past and probable future, and thus may appear at seances under the guise of a deceased loved one. There are more bothersome, well, they are more bothersome on the physical plane than any other plane. So these are other entities, uh, these and other entities exist on higher planes. Those of the single mind will not harm you unless you try to stop them from their goal. Those connected to the entities on the physical plane are usually too involved with the physical plane to bother you. So there is one type of entity which exists on higher planes which can be problematic. Your own thought forms. One in particular I can think of right off is Sozo and whatever Mama. There we go. Here, form is the key word. On higher planes, thoughts do take on various forms representing their nature. So think back about what Zozo is. Who created it? There we go. And unfortunately, you do not have to consciously create them. Thus, on higher planes, you may come in contact with ugly, foul monsters of hideous appearance who attempt to stop you from achieving your goals. So they are only your own fear, angers, prejudices, etc. They will not harm you. They will not harm you themselves. Uh, for to harm for to harm you would wait where'd I go oh it would cause their own destruction but because most people are too frightened to examine or even look at the darker side of themselves most people will run in terror at the sight of their own negative thought forms it sounds like somebody who created Zozo so this can keep you from accomplishing a goal of direct communication with higher spiritual entities. That's why I tell people, just get, just stop it. Quit. Quit thinking about Zozo. Get it out of you. It's, it's nothing. So, visualizing a pentagram of bright blue light, specked with brilliant gold flecks, and shooting it out at them will keep them away. The only way to really get rid of them is to face them with your fear. And that's exactly what I did, as you guys can see in the Zozo videos. So, and overcome these neg the negative aspects of yourself which created them. Few magicians are ever really physically attached. Through banishings, the attack may be temporarily stopped, but it will not end until the magician has dealt with and conquered the inner source of the negative thought form. Hmm. Please understand that I am not encouraging you to stay and face the monsters of your own inner self, monsters which we all have. 
um, in this type of battle, it is a wise person who runs away and lives to fight another day. At some time, sooner or later, you will have to face and conquer your own demons, and you will be happier for it. So that's pretty good. Pretty good. So, alright, we've covered a lot of um, directing magical energy. We've covered um, thought forms, the astral body is off, artificial elementals, um, the empty ones, elementaries, larvae, ghosts, suedo ghosts, all of that. So tomorrow we will do part two, and it's going to tell us an astral lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. So, I love it. It's very exciting. The suspense is just, I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> so yes, it is very suspenseful for me, personally, with that book. I mean, everything is just very suspenseful. I'm just, I can't wait to actually go, you know, and do this. And really, when you start to manifest stuff, I mean, looking back on each day for what each card I have pulled for each day, the synchronicities, what have happened, what has happened, it's been amazing. It has seriously been amazing. That is why everybody, I think, in the Ouija boot camp, that is why I always had you guys reenact, do the tarot, bring it out, pull one card per day, focus on it, let it just soak into your subconscious. Scanning the card, which was in the very beginning of the book, all of it, dealing with the psychic attack, with the triangle of manifestation, throwing it out, it's all perfect, it's, it's so amazing. It takes quite a few years, for me it did, it has, to go through the entire book, about ten times, ten times, and really implement and put those practices to use, and it works. It is very worth it. So, what did you guys manifest last night? What seeds did you plant? Any? I would love to know. So, alright guys, um, I will see you all tomorrow uh, for Witchy Wednesday, and we will go over part two of this lesson. So, um, I love you all very much, all of my heart, all the way from Venus, all the way back down. And, yes, let me know what you guys think below. And I love you all, and thank you guys for watching. So, I will see you guys soon.